Let's see if this is working. Okay. It says that there are 234 people here. Um, are you guys seeing this? So I am streaming on another separate live. All right, let's see if this works. So there's 225, 225 people. Okay, can't rotate it. Where are the comments? Good audio and video, sweet. All right, everybody can see me now. We're rolling. Um, cool, we're working here. All right, you guys, what is up? Thank you for pre-selling the book. Thank you for pre-ordering the book. Uh, I'm still trying to get all this stuff figured out with live on YouTube. What's up, Virginia, how's it going? Um, I'll hang out with you guys for a while. We'll answer all your questions. There is tons um, of questions here. It looks like there's 211 people on. Uh, this one is working. So if you guys um, are so if you guys are listening on the one with no video, get out of that one and go to the other live feed. So there's a separate live feed that I just started that should have video. So I'm doing this one from my cell phone because on my computer, I didn't figure it out. I don't want you guys to have to wait. So if you guys are seeing the black screen, go over to the other one and um, check it out. I am live on my channel in the other live stream. So yeah, check that out, you guys. All right, so let's start. Let's answer some of these questions from you guys. Um, the first question is, let's see here. If you guys do not see the video, it is my bad um, because I haven't figured it out. I do it on my computer yet. I was getting it all figured out and it's too much uh, to do right now. I don't wanna do it while you guys are all waiting. So if you are seeing only a black screen on the computer, go over to the separate live. I started a separate feed. You guys can watch it there. So first question, random question, any stories about people recovering from histamine intolerance? Uh, yeah, I definitely think people can recover from histamine intolerance pretty easily. I don't think we know what causes histamine intolerance. I do think that there is a need to think about the foods you're eating if you have histamine intolerance um, and consider something like um, uh, like a DAO supplement. Um, Ed Bailey says um, that when he went carnivore, the histamine intolerance got better. Um, and I, I mean, kidneys have DAO. DAO is diamine oxidase. So people have sometimes found improvements with um, diamine oxidase supplements directly, Seeking Health makes one, or you can use the ancestral supplements, um, Seeking, uh, ancestral supplements, DAO kidney uh, is gonna have some in there, and people have something with that. Uh, Jana says, same here, nothing but carnivore equals uh, no histamine, no migraines. So that's good, diamine oxidase, people are talking about that. Um, somebody says, DL Sharp says, seasonal allergies went away on a carnivore diet, which is awesome, that's super cool. Um, Seeking Health is a good brand for DAO. Someone said that. I would also recommend um, a, a kidney. And I talked a little bit about kidney in a recent podcast that it's going to come out soon. And that one, <clears throat> it, uh, he had some concerns about cadmium. So we actually had kidney tested from White Oak Pastures. And it was pretty low cadmium, much lower than what I have seen on many other uh, papers looking at high cadmium fish and stuff. So if you're getting uh, kidney from a good source, from a grass-fed source like white oak, it's probably going to be just fine in terms of cadmium. Uh, and actually, I was, it was striking for me when I did that, the, um, the cadmium content of shellfish was pretty high. Anyway, I digress. So let's see here. What other questions? Um, strategies to deal with a damaged liver and how would you best get rid of abdominal visceral fat from Lanka? So, um, Damaged liver, it would depend what has damaged the liver. If it's NAFLD, so it's non, if it's non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, then um, that is probably gonna be insulin resistance and you'd wanna really limit fructose. There is some good evidence that excess fructose is going to cause problems with that kind of stuff. So I would limit fructose. I would limit carbohydrates. You can probably become improved, you can improve your insulin resistance by uh, limiting fat or limiting carbohydrates, but you probably have to limit one or the other. Um, like I talked about in the podcast with Stan Efforting, um, it seems that in humans, 
uh, we need to be careful about the combination of those two nutrients. So depending what has caused your fatty liver or your liver damage link, uh, that would be the way to do it. And how to get rid of abdominal visceral fat, that is insulin resistance until uh, proven otherwise. And uh, a low carbohydrate diet will help with insulin resistance as will finding the source of inflammation because there are many things that can cause inflammation. And inflammation in the body seems to trigger insulin resistance. Overfeeding can trigger inflammation. Overfeeding can trigger insulin resistance. So this is all kind of the, it's all connected, right? If we overfeed on carbs and fat together, we can trigger insulin resistance. So we don't wanna do that. So you either wanna get majority of your calories from carbohydrates or the majority of your calories from fat. That's my opinion. I think if you uh, try and combine those two, we often run into problems if there is a caloric surplus. If there's a caloric deficit, you'll be fine. But in, in this caloric surplus, if there is a mixing of macronutrients, that I think appears to lead to insulin resistance. Um, what else we got here? Somebody says they're in Hungary. Um, all right. Um, what do we got here? Somebody, okay, somebody saying hi. Catching up with a comment for you guys. Can you explain the impact of carnivore on PCOS and if it is possible to gain a period back with it? Absolutely. This is Vika Miller 1. Absolutely. Um, PCOS is really a condition of insulin resistance. And like I was saying, there are many ways to correct insulin resistance. I think insulin resistance is mostly related to um, overfeeding of mixed macronutrients or underlying inflammation in the human body. So if you're not overfeeding on mixed macronutrients, um, insulin resistance should get better. And if it continues, then you um, want to think about other sources of inflammation in the human body and look for inflammation in the human body. Do HSCRP, do other things like that, which will look to see where the inflammation is. There are all sorts of inflammatory markers we can look at. So I definitely think a carnivore diet will help with PCOS. Um, uh, do, do, do sodium, potassium pump, read on it, that's a question. Um, I want to stop dairy, but concerned about oxalate dumping, an issue before. would love to know a good source of calcium, such as bone meal, which brand to minimize dumping and stay clean. Thank you. So Susan Tenney asks that question. What's very interesting is I am doing a podcast later today. Uh, it's a monologue podcast. I'm going to be doing for Ben Greenfield's podcast, and I'll release it on my podcast and YouTube when it comes out on Ben's podcast. But I was researching bone broth. And in the past, I have said that bone broth doesn't have a whole lot of minerals in it. And I think I was wrong. So there was a... Um, a paper that I found, and I probably had seen this paper before, but not looked at it carefully enough, that showed that if you cook bone broth, and these are gonna be grass-fed bones, like the best ones you can get, right? If you do grass-fed bones, bone broth, with an acid solution, so two to three tablespoons of uh, an organic, you know, white vinegar per liter of solution in the bone broth, and you cook it for 12 hours, the amount of calcium in the bone broth is increased significantly, like 20%, 20 times, 20x. And the magnesium content is also increased significantly. So um, one of the things I'm going to talk about in that podcast for Ben is that the overall acid-base balance of a human is dependent on diet. And there are both acidic contributions and uh, basic or alkaline contributions. The place that people, where people get confused about this is that they think that the cellular pH, or we can't really measure that, at least the blood pH is going to change. The blood pH doesn't change what we'll see is a change in urinary pH and a change in the serum bicarbonate. So what I would recommend is if people are doing a carnivore diet or people are doing a ketogenic diet, check your urinary pH, check your serum bicarbonate. Urinary pH should be greater than six. And um, the um, urinary pH could be, should be greater than six and um, the serum bicarbonate should be uh, greater than 23 or 24. It should be within normal. And so when you're doing those things, when you're doing those things, what you will find is that if you're getting enough calcium, magnesium, potassium in your diet from things like bone uh, broth or bone meal, then um, the pH of the body should normalize. So if somebody is asking a good source of calcium, I would say bone broth would probably be my favorite source. You can use bone meal from a low lead source. You just have to make sure it's tested very carefully. And you don't want the, um, you don't want the, lead content of that bone meal to be high. If you're using bone meal and it's not tested for lead, I would not use that. Some people can also use uh, eggshells. I found them to be constipating their calcium carbonate. You wanna eat them separate from, um, uh, separate from food. So the take home with regard to minerals would be 
Um, I think a good bone meal is probably the best thing you can do, which means we have to make it. Again, it's gonna be an acidic solution, at least 12 hours with good bones, and then you'll get minerals, including calcium, potassium, and uh, magnesium, which will balance the acidic contributions of the rest of the diet, so more protein. And then I think what I have seen in my practice is that urinary pH will improve to get to be above six, and serum bicarbonate will improve as well. All right, so hopefully that helps there. Um, Paul may say something, may Paul, something about calcium citrate. Um, yeah, I, I think that calcium citrate may be helpful for oxalate dumping. If you really think you're having oxalate dumping, um, calcium citrate may be helpful, but I think calcium in general will be helpful, in which case a, uh, a, a good bone broth would be helpful. All right, so let's see here. Let's get caught up. Um, somebody says, please help. My mom has Schnitzler syndrome. Won't listen to me about carnivore due to the typical, uh, my doc says, I can't because of the cholesterol situation. How do we convince people like this? So um, the, um, I would say if people are concerned about cholesterol, it's going to be an uphill battle because the paradigm is so ingrained. It is so ingrained, it's just crazy. And the way to do it is to uh, have them educate themselves and look at, the, I mean, I would recommend many of the podcasts I've done with Dave Feldman and Vera Lee. And there's a whole chapter in my book, probably the longest chapter in my book is chapter 11, and it is on lipids and the fallacy of the cholesterol model of disease and the fallacy of using LDL as the main predictor for L, uh, cardiovascular risk. So it's a nuanced discussion, which is challenging. But I think that when people dig into it, they will see that the evidence that suggests that LDL is directly causing or directly implicated in the formation of atherosclerotic plaque or the progression of heart disease is, um, is pretty, pretty weak. And so I, it's, it's going to be a tricky one, though, because it's so hard to do that education. So when in May is the next Oakchella dates? I believe it's gonna be the first weekend of May next year, you guys. So White Oakchella was amazing this year. You guys should all come next year. I think it's gonna be the first weekend of May, but I will let you all know soon. Somebody asks, uh, knowing that older adults need more protein due to muscle protein resistance, what is the max time window to get enough each meal? Is it okay to cycle and uh, low and high protein days? So it depends how old you are. This is Carney5 asking the question. What is the max time window to get enough at each meal? So I, I guess you're asking how long each meal should be. I think that as long as you're eating the protein within 30 minutes or 40 minutes within a meal, you'll be fine. And um, I am interviewing Gabrielle Lyon later today for my podcast, which will be out in a few weeks. And um, she and um, Don Lehman talk a lot about the need for 2.6 grams of leucine which will come from a variety of sources of food, but we need at least that much to trigger muscle protein synthesis. So I think that she's totally right about this, that we should be thinking about that very carefully. Um, what else we got? Um, any, uh, any suggestion on how to deal with cravings when going carnivore? Uh, I hear a lot of this from people um, about um, cravings on carnivore and I think that it's important to use organ meats. It's important to use um, the most mineral rich foods that we can, a mineral rich bone broth. And that the cravings are probably part of the transition. I think most people are going to get cravings when they um, transition uh, to a different diet, when they cut out carbohydrates. So it's part of the process, expect it to happen, embrace it and use the most mineral rich foods you can. Um, sometimes things like mineral water can be helpful as a treat or something to distract yourself. but. Um, the, the cravings to me suggest that the body is really going through something um, in terms of um, transition and it's a good process. And as long as you're giving yourself enough nutrients, that's my best suggestion for that. Um, doo -doo -doo. Somebody says, Paul, any experience with carnivore diet and alopecia? Uh, just anecdotal experience from what I've seen people on Instagram, some people are saying that um, depending on the cause of the alopecia, it, um, it improved. Um, occasionally, people will say um, that the, they have hair loss. And I think that if, in the, if there's hair loss, we have to be very careful whether it's increased hair turnover or actual real hair loss. So if there's real hair loss, you need to check your thyroid and make sure you're getting enough um, calories and really dig into that. Um, okay. 
Somebody says, I feel function and look my best on carnivore. That's awesome. What's my take on vitamin C while eating carnivore, Michael R? So I don't think you need it. Um, you can certainly check your markers of oxidative stress. You can check f 2 prostanes. You can check 8-hydroxy-2-deoxyguanosine. You can check all of those markers. So in my recent newsletter, which you can sign up for at um, Carnivore MD, I talked about an article in which the amount of vitamin C in the participants' diets was increased from 70 to 240 milligrams per day with more fruits and vegetables. And there was no change in markers of oxidative stress or antioxidant capacity with that change. So I think that on a nose-to-tail carnivore diet, it's pretty easy to get enough um, vitamin C or to get 70 milligrams of vitamin C. I think that the body will probably be fine with less than that. And I think that it's not, I'm open to the fact that I may be wrong about this, but I don't think so right now. I have a lot of conversations with James D. Antonio and Chris Masterjohn about this frequently, but I think that what is going on here, um, I'm just not convinced that excess doses of vitamin C are really needed to achieve optimal antioxidant status in the human body. And so I don't think you need it. And how do you get 70 milligrams of vitamin C a day on carnivore or 40 milligrams of vitamin C on carnivore? It's getting organ meat. So uh, a couple of ounces of liver should have 20 to 30 milligrams of vitamin C. A couple of ounces of kidney should have it. Um, there's some vitamin C in meat, uh, as long as you don't overcook it. Uh, adding other organs, it's basically in the organ meats and that will help. Um, all right. So, what else is going on here? How significant is how long one has had an autoimmune disease in terms of recovery? Uh, that's a good question. I think that the longer you've had an autoimmune disease, the more likely the target tissue is going to be damaged. And that can be tough. So if a target tissue is damaged, it may not actually recover function. Um, but I think that autoimmune disease theoretically should be able to be reversed regardless of whether you've had it for a long amount of time or a short amount of time. It just has to do with preservation of the tissue um, that the autoimmune disease is targeting. All right. How long should it take to get insulin sensitivity back after being diabetic and on insulin for several years? Uh, it would probably depend on body composition and um, visceral adiposity, Kathy asks. So um, I think that if, you're, if you can get to a healthy weight, it will happen faster, but it might take a little while. Um, if you can remove the inflammation, that would be great. I think that pretty quickly, if you can create a caloric deficit and if you can create um, a... Uh, a cessation of caloric overfeeding, it will improve. Um, if you've been on insulin, you'll want to check insulin frequently and just watch and see how the body is reacting and making it, but it would depend on visceral adiposity and overall body weight, but it should happen. Uh -huh. Carnivore for people with hemochromatosis possible. Yes, um, hemochromatosis, uh, traditional hemochromatosis is just a disease of over avid absorption of iron and um, there are other types of hemochromatosis that may make the answer to this question more complex. If there is a uh, problem with hematopoiesis that is causing iron buildup, but if you are strictly um, like uh, what I would call regular hemochromatosis, um, you can just do uh, phlebotomy regularly and it should be fine. Um, do, do, do. All right, what else we got here? Somebody says, take your time, man. <laughs> yeah, uh, so much to talk about, you guys. Um, all right, just looking for more questions. Somebody says, always test before using. I know, I know, I've just been so busy trying to do cool stuff, you guys. I'll get it figured out. I'll do more of these. All right, we're getting down through the first set of questions. I'm gonna to get to as many as I can, you guys. Uh, somebody says, hey Paul, what would you recommend to me suffering from constipation in the carnivore diet? I've been doing a high fat beef water diet for 1.5 years, yet slow digestion constipation won't fix. Um, I would be curious how high fat you're doing it and whether you're using salt. Um, the human colon should uh, function normally with adequate salt and adequate fat and adequate water. 
So um, that would be my first suggestion. I wonder how much fat you're doing and I wonder how much salt you're doing. Uh, and I also wonder about preceding constipation prior. If higher fat, uh, more salt, and uh, a decent amount of water do not improve it, then you could look at some probiotics. Saccharomyces boulardii, lactobacillus GG, lactobacillus rutiri, which is uh, biogaii gastris. All right. Uh, Rhonda Patrick, never heard of her, just kidding, says most important thing for gut health is disperse prebiotic fibers without bacteria, eat mucin, and this is the number one cause of breakdown of gut barrier, scientific consensus, what do you think? Thanks for this question, Amanda, I think she's wrong. Um, I think that she is basing this on one study from Cell from 2014, which was done in rats and was a contrived model and did not actually show any inflammation in the gut. And I think that um, though it is important for our bacteria and our small intestine to make short chain fatty acids, we um, can do that from a variety of sources. We can make short chain fatty acids and from protein, um, from a variety of proteins, from muscle meat, from collagen. In the book, I talk about a study done in cheetahs where they can ferment collagen into um, butyrate and isobutyrate and short chain fatty acids. So there really is no evidence that um, prebiotic fibers are directly connected with gut diversity of the microbiome. There are interventional studies which show the reverse. Specifically, they show that increasing the amount of fiber in the diet does not um, improve the microbiota diversity and that removal of fiber does not decrease the microbiome diversity. There was actually a study done on the carnivore diet that was a week long and compared it to a plant-based diet. And it, uh, there was no change in alpha diversity, which is the main measure of gut diversity on a carnivore diet. So I, I think that she is wrong and I would love to debate her on that uh, significantly. I'm having Chris Cressera on my podcast in January and I will be taking him to task on that too. Most of the people who are saying that prebiotic fiber is necessary for gut diversity, um, I believe they're basing it all on epidemiology and I think it's quite misleading because when you look at the, um, the interventional studies, they don't say that. What we are eating in our diet, the fiber is not how we get a diverse microbiome. Okay. Catching up here. Oh, what happened? Do, 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 do. All right. So if you guys are not seeing the video, you want to go over to a different stream. I'm doing it on my phone in a separate stream than this original one. So if you don't see the stream, go to the other one. Yep. Um, I just want to make sure I'm getting all the questions. Well, lots here. Um, is having a low GFR after eating a uh, cause for concern when GFR below before breakfast is optimal. Um, Tyler, if you're, I don't know how you're calculating GFR. If you're checking your creatinine after you're eating, then that's um, not gonna be accurate because um, creatine from meat can cause increased creatinine in the blood. You need to triangulate that with a cystatin C. So if your GFR is normal before at breakfast, Tyler, you're fine. Um, and it's gonna be an eGFR based on the creatinine, presumably. And I would also check cystatin C. Um, how much should we interpret food palatability as an indication of optimal diet? I've been carnivore for 1.5 years and steak still isn't super palatable or satisfying. What does that mean? Uh, I think that palatability is a tough thing to use as a, um, as a real uh, indicator of food. I mean, we can think about junk food. Uh, I don't think you're asking that, David. I think if you're thinking about whole food um, and palatability, um, it, it probably is a reasonable metric to look at, but if steak isn't palatable or satisfying, um, that's unusual. I think a lot of people find it to be more so, and I'd be curious what is more palatable for you in that situation. Are there benefits for dementia on a carnivore diet? Yeah, I think that there probably are in terms of nutrients, so micronutrients, carnitine, choline, carnosine, creatine. We know those are all ergogenic nutrients for the brain. They are all intelligence-enhancing uh, nutrients. So, um, and then we also have to think about what's causing the dementia. If the dementia is caused by uh, insulin resistance or worsened by insulin resistance, uh, there seems to be a large component of insulin resistance on 
uh, in an Alzheimer's situation, um, improving that with something like a carnivore diet could, uh, could improve things significantly. Can you speak to high fasting blood glucose on carnivore with ketones present after years of normal blood glucose on keto, thin 20% body fat female? Um, I would have to know how high the fasting glucose is uh, on carnivore with ketones and what your ketone levels are. And I would be curious about fat to protein ratios and whether you are potentially overfeeding protein, not getting enough fat. Um, a lot of people will see fasting blood glucose um, levels that are a little bit higher on a strict carnivore diet, maybe in the 80s or 90s. So I'm not sure if that's what you're referring to, Sarah. And I think it may have to do with um, uh, you know, a lot of protein in the diet. So that's a, that's a questionable um, thing. I'd have to know a little more detail there. Um, thanks for buying the book this morning, Rob. Uh, Rob says, please discuss spices after 40 days on carnivore. I still need spices to enjoy the meat. How much is spices a challenge on carnivore? So it depends which spices you're using, Rob. Um, I divide spices into two categories, the herbs and the spices. So herbs would be like the leaf spices, which I think are probably less of an issue. They're small doses and they're going to be mostly for flavoring. For some people with autoimmune disease or um, uh, rashes or who are very sensitive, the leaf spices might even still trigger them. But um, the seed spices are the ones that I'm more concerned about because they're seeds. And I think the seeds are probably more triggering for people. This would be things like cardamom, cumin, black pepper, other things. So I would avoid those. Um, if you guys are joining and you don't see video here, there's a separate feed that I am doing on my phone because um, I dropped the ball and didn't figure out how to do the video on my regular stream. I'm sorry, you guys. What is your take on carnivore to treat methane dominant SIBO and leaky gut? I think it's a great adjunct for that, James, and uh, there is no good treatment for that that I'm aware of. It's a difficult thing to treat, and I think that when we are looking at gut dysbiosis, we have to be pretty honest with ourselves that, um, that there's a real problem here, and that um, how we correct gut stuff seems to be one of the more challenging things for me in practice now. Um, I think a carnivore diet is a great first step, followed by probiotics, followed potentially by fecal microbiota transplantation. Kareen uh, Savard asks rosacea solution. So rosacea is SIBO until proven otherwise, in my opinion. So it's something in the gut, and I would look there with the GI map. Do you think the level of iodine supply could be contributing to the prevalence of hypothyroidism, given that we are defining hypothyroidism with an elevated T TSH? Um, from Davin. Uh, hey, what's up, Davin? Um, uh, well, I, I, we, Davin and I have had conversations af offline about uh, iodine um, and hypothyroid and TSH is possible. Um, and I think that we don't really know how much um, iodine we need as humans, but the current recommendation is 150 micrograms, which is easily obtainable from um, egg yolks and a reasonable amount of meat and some organs in a day without even, even eating seafood. So I, I think that that's reasonable. And as some of you may know, excess iodine supplementation can be dangerous. Uh, and I don't think excess iodine is something we would have had evolutionarily. Somebody says, I struggle with the notion of extreme diets. I have extreme, I have psoriasis, which may be connected to gut issues. I tried eating a high meat, high fat diet, had some negative reactions in my heart area know why. Um, I would suspect that that would be related to electrolyte imbalance and perhaps there was not enough salt. Um, I too struggle with the notion of extreme diets. I don't necessarily see a carnivore diet as extreme. I think that extreme is a relative term and if we define extreme um, based on what we might imagine indigenous peoples and our ancestors to be eating, I don't think a carnivore diet is extreme. Um, I think complete elimination of all plants is not something any culture throughout human history has done that we're aware of, but I think cultures have gotten pretty darn close. And um, that, to me, suggests that a carnivore diet is not extreme. I would say that standard American diets are very extreme, and I don't think that um, creating or qualifying any diet relative to uh, a standard American diet is a good metric. Do you think someone with a, an elevated TSH with a normal free thyroid hormone levels needs to be treated with thyroid hormone? So elevated TSH, normal uh, free thyroid hormone levels need to be treated with thyroid hormone. 
Um, I think that in that situation, you need to understand, you need to look and see why the TSH is elevated in the first place and how elevated it is. Um, what is causing an elevated TSH? Um, I think that what we know is that serum levels of thyroid hormones don't necessarily reflect tissue sensitivity. So I would go by what someone's symptoms were in that situation, though um, that's more rare. It can happen. Certainly in mainstream Western medicine, we would qualify that as um, subclinical hypothyroid, um, but I think that we're still learning about that condition. Someone says, if the body is smart enough to do gluconeogenesis on demand, why would it be dumb enough to elevate homocysteine levels when surplus muscle meat is consumed? No selective pressures against the latter. Well, postprandial um, homocysteine levels cannot be used as a homocysteine indicator. So it's just, you're gonna have more homocysteine in your body after you eat meat. So it has to be a fasting homocysteine. And um, homocysteine levels should not be elevated in someone that has adequate folate, B12, B6, and riboflavin is the most important one. Hi, Paul. Do you have any articles or content on RCTs covering plant toxins? I still find the hormesis argument more convincing than the toxin argument. So there are um, some RCTs on plant toxins. Um, they're not randomized, but they're in cell culture. And I mentioned these in the book. Um, I reference all of the studies looking at DNA breaks with plant toxins. With the hormesis argument, the problem we have with hormesis for plants is that we don't need it, that it's a redundant effect that has side effects. So I've talked about this recently on some podcasts with regard to the package insert for plant molecules. And I think that what we're forgetting is that plant molecules have side effects. And we're never told about these side effects. And why would we take a plant molecule for hormesis if there's really no good evidence that that is necessary? Because there are plenty of good studies, our randomized controlled trials that show that the inclusion of plants in the human diet does nothing for us, doesn't make us any better, right? So if we're already healthy, I think that the plant toxins just create the package insert side effects and they really don't give us the benefits that we're hoping for. So I think hormesis is real with environmental things and there is part of plant molecules which may have hormesis effects in the human body, but I think that they're redundant and they're not necessary and we can get all those benefits and all that optimization of um, our physiology without them. Somebody says, difficult to find grass-fed meat. What is the difference in some sort of figures if you have only usual meat. Well, if you look at the studies regarding glutathione and um, nutrients, it's small, um, but there is a difference. I think that the main problem um, with non-grass-fed meat is the toxins that may be in meat, whether this is persistent organic pollutants or um, other things like that, uh, pesticides, things like that. So yeah, um, it looks like the people are still commenting on both feeds. I'll try and answer the rest of these and then I'll go to the questions on the, the video feed to make sure I get to these. Um, there's a ton. Hopefully I'm getting to some of your questions, guys. Um, all right, so somebody says, my maintenance caloric intake is about 3,500 cows. I've been keto for the past two years, but I'm still dealing with eczema. So I'm tempted to try carnivore, but I wonder how to get enough calories. Um, I would say fat would be the main thing, and we're not used to eating fat, but uh, suet trimmings, you will easily get 3,500 calories. As long as you get enough protein, you'll be fine. Um, answer the question on carnivore and dementia. Strict carnivore for the past six months, beef liver, lamb, salmon roe, cod liver, IVF, brain fog resolved. Awesome. Still break out with itchy, welt-like bumps on my face and neck. Hmm. Um... I'm not sure. I would wonder about other things in your diet. Um, I guess it depends on, are you histamine sensitive? Is the salmon roe perhaps triggering? Is there something that remains that is triggering you there? Um, salmon roe and cod liver is uh, quite a bit of omega-3. In my opinion, probably too much. That's a whole nother rabbit hole. Um, does carnivore diet only help increase lean body mass while weightlifting? Um, I'm not quite sure the question. I definitely think a carnivore diet could help increase lean body mass. You would want to, um, you would want to uh, eat frequently throughout the day with smaller meals, right? Um, what do we got here? Uh, 
Okay, when I talk about potassium on carnivore, um, potassium on carnivore is uh, usually just fine um, because you're eating muscle meat and muscle meat is very high in potassium. So one pound of muscle meat has about 1400 milligrams of potassium. And I think that you can also get um, potassium from um, uh, your water, a little bit from water, a little bit from bone broth. But I think that there's plenty of potassium because meat is super high in potassium or reasonably high in potassium. And I think that the, the overall thinking about potassium has been that uh, we need tons and tons of it. And I think that if your um, blood pressure is normal, you're probably getting plenty of potassium. So I don't think that we really have to have six grams or five grams or four grams of potassium daily. I probably eat about two pounds of meat a day, so I'm getting at least 3,000 milligrams of potassium just from the meat I'm eating, and I think that that's probably fine for most of us. Earlier in the live stream, I talked about minerals and bone broth, and I think that can be helpful as well. Um, somebody says, I'm a trainer. Do you think going carnivore will help somebody with colitis or Crohn's? I have a new uh, client that has that issue. Yeah, I think that that's um, totally possible. Uh, there definitely are many anecdotes out there of people doing um, all sorts of elimination diets and having improvements in inflammatory bowel disease. So I would, I would strongly consider that. I think it could be helpful. Somebody says, I've been carnivore for two years. On occasion, eat avocados and olives, but thinking of adding in sweet potatoes, what's your take on sweet potatoes? Thanks. Um, I don't know why you would add sweet potatoes. If you are trying to leverage carbohydrates, perhaps, sweet potatoes have a moderate amount of oxalates. Um, they're not a nightshade. It's probably better than some other stuff that's out there. Um, I think that if you want to do a, um, a carbohydrate on a carnivore diet or a carnivore-ish diet, squash is another decent one. Um, I would just be curious what the um, addition of the sweet potatoes would be for um, overall. But yeah, I think sweet potatoes are reasonable. See how you react. Realize they have a small amount of oxalate or a moderate amount of oxalate. So probably fine. Um, yeah. I heard a psychiatrist say that the Atkins diet is not recommended for patients with OCD because it will deplete them of serotonin. Is that true? That's not true. Um, we can pass tryptophan across the blood-brain barrier with, uh, without carbohydrates in the diet. We all do it every day. Um, it has to do with the amount of tryptophan. So I can imagine that if someone, a psychiatrist is saying that, they're thinking about tryptophan moving across the blood-brain barrier and being a precursor for uh, serotonin formation and tryptophan is also a precursor for melatonin production. So in the book I answer this question as well, but the the it's not an issue of insulin, um, but when we eat carbs, insulin is released and that causes many of the long chain amino acids to go into the muscle and the relative concentration of tryptophan goes up. Well, the interesting thing about a carnivore diet is you're eating lots of protein and the relative concentration of tryptophan also goes up. It's just about the relative concentration of tryptophan relative uh, well, in comparison to the large neutral amino acids that gets tryptophan across the blood-brain barrier. It's not insulin dependent. So um, should be able to get plenty of tryptophan across the blood-brain barrier on a low carbohydrate diet as long as you're getting um, uh, plenty of protein, which I would say one gram per pound of body weight. Um, Diane asks about leg cramps at night, uh, to which I would say more sodium, probably, and more other electrolytes. So this is where something like an electrolyte bone broth comes in. I think cramps can also be related to calcium, magnesium, manganese, and boron, as well as potassium and salt. Uh, the first thing would be sodium, and I wonder how much of that you are getting. Have I read Dr. Thomas Leroy on using large doses of vitamin C in healing diseases and inflammations? I'm familiar with it, and I think it's wrong. Um, I, I don't think that there is a role for large doses of vitamin C. There are some evidence that large doses of vitamin C may help during cancer, but that's because it's cytotoxic and it's killing cells. So large doses of vitamin C, I think, can be used much like chemotherapy in cancer, but we don't take chemotherapy every day. And I think people get confused about that. So I'm not a fan of megadosing vitamin C. Um, so someone says, what are your thoughts on sunscreen? I want to mitigate the effects of aging, but I've heard so much about the dangers of sunscreen. So when I am in places that are very sunny, I, um, I, uh, I use a zinc-based sunscreen with no parabens or phthalates, and that is from Badger. That's what I would use for sunscreen. Um, you mentioned you were trying to introduce raw dairy. What were your allergic symptoms? So I've, my raw dairy experiment has now failed times four for me. Um, I get like itchiness in my beard. My scalp gets kind of itchy. 
in the past I had recurrence recrudescence of eczema and it doesn't seem to work well for me despite doing like raw goat's milk. Um, so yeah, didn't work for me. Any insight into food and ADHD? I found egg yolks, liver, and citicoline supplements uh, help, but any other thoughts given your psychiatry training? So Nicole asks that question. There's a great study I've seen in the past, Nicole, on ADHD being treated most effectively with um, uh, food elimination diets. So I think that for kids, uh, I have to look at the exact figures, but it was on the order. It was comparable to stimulants for ADHD, food elimination diets. So um, this is kind of the um, the approach, like no dyes, no additives. And I think that potentially food sensitivity could be an issue with ADHD. Um, somebody says type one here, blood sugar high with higher meat protein, increased insulins significantly, still high. Um, that's interesting. I've definitely heard of other people having improvements in type one diabetes with um, a carnivore diet. I would wonder how much protein you're doing, Brooke, uh, Brooke Graves, and what your fat to protein ratio is. Um, somebody asks about ankylosing spondylitis. Anyone have success putting it in remission? I, I definitely think that um, there are cases of that being improved significantly. I might have even posted about some on my Instagram. Yeah. Current mentor activation on nonstop amino acids comments. Uh, so you're not getting nonstop amino acids on a carnivore diet. You're eating amino acids, which we need for muscle protein synthesis, which we need to turn mTOR on. And then you're fasting between meals and then you're fasting throughout the day. So um, the muscle protein synthesis is like a switch and it can go on and off. And I think we should trigger it every day to maintain lean muscle mass and we should not become sarcopenic. And then we should consider doing a, um, a fast um, overnight or you know some time restricted eating depending on where we are physiologically as humans. So I think this idea that uh, amino acids are going to overstimulate mTOR is wrong because other triggers of mTOR are exercise, which we know is beneficial, and insulin, which you're going to have if you're eating a lot of carbohydrates. So unless you're going to eat only fat, lay in your bed all day, and never exercise, um, you're going to be triggering uh, mTOR, and that's okay. Um, one of the things I'm going to talk about with Gabrielle Lyon in the podcast later today is that um, the studies on mTOR and cancer with regard to protein are done in uh, flawed animal models, and there's really no good evidence there. Micronutrient balances on just carnivore comments. Um, not if you are eating nose to tail, my friend. Um, so well, what protein requirements uh, should we stick to one gram per pound of lean body mass or weight? Thank you, can't wait for the book to come out. Uh, one gram of protein per uh, pound of body mass, I think is reasonable, um, I would do that. So a little more. Hi, my hair started falling out in patches after three months on carnivore. Started with painful scalp, used to be 68 kilograms, went down to 56, 57 kilograms, um, mainly eat beef muscle. So Kat asks that question. So I think that that, um, I think that that is an indication that something is wrong. And if you're only eating beef muscle, my first thought is, uh, you're, are you deficient in folate? You know, is your methylation? off? Do you have enough riboflavin? Probably not. So the first thing I would suggest is uh, add organs and add fat. Um, and for many people, that improves things significantly. Uh, Don Adams says they can't see me. I'm doing another feed as well concurrently with my phone where there's video. So sorry about that, Don. When eating OMAD carnivore, is there anything to be mindful of? Um, I think for Andrew Williams asking that question, yeah, I'd want to check your hormones and make sure you're getting enough calories. I've seen hormones be affected negatively when eating um, when eating uh, uh, a OMAD diet. So I'm not a huge fan of that. Why may some people with autoimmune diseases like psoriasis react badly to eating pork? Oh, good question. I think it probably has to do with what the pork is fed and the accumulation of things in pork which may trigger them immunologically. So pork is one of these meats that's pretty hard to actually get uh, good quality. Um, restless legs, any research on carnivore clearing this god awful disease? Um, a lot of restless legs is related to iron deficiency, so I would check ferritin, and I mean, heme iron is a good way to do that. It probably has an autoimmune component as well. I believe I have heard of people having improvement on restless legs on a carnivore diet. How long does it take to adapt for energy, sleep, well-being? How long to adapt athletically, 90, 180 days? Um, this is a good question. So I think there's a keto adaptation period, and as I talked about with Chris Masterjohn, there is um, uh, an adjustment, but the it, it does appear that after time um 
keto adapted athletes perform similarly to high carb athletes. Uh, and there are studies in both high intensity interval training and endurance training. So um, I would say probably 90 days, 90 to 180. Yeah. Um, and that, I think that's something that would have happened to us over the course of our lives and we would never have noticed evolutionarily. That's just my guess that as a children, we would have had three to six months of low carb and we would have been adjusted. And as adult humans today, we've never had a period of being low carb since we were, you know, a kid. We were all in ketosis as kids, but um, I think that the um, that's not something that we experience much. And the first time that we experience it is when we think about something like a ketogenic diet. So that's tricky. Um, somebody says, is there any reason to the carnivore diet could cause microscopic hematuria? No, it should not. You should not have microscopic hematuria from a carnivore diet um, unless you're having a kidney stone, perhaps. Um, I wonder about occasional oxalate kidney stones from oxalate dumping on a carnivore diet. It's hypothetical, but it's possible. So microscopic hematuria would make me wonder about a kidney stone. Somebody says, I'm an overmethylator. How does carnivore affect that? I don't believe in over and under methylators. So I think that this is a wrong. Um, I don't believe in Walsh's theories with regard to this. I think that you have an MTHFR enzyme which converts L5-methylfolate or it converts 510-methylene um, tetrahydrofolate to L5-methylfolate. And um, that enzyme is going to work uh, in a variety of ways depending on your uh, polymorphisms, your genetics, and those can be accounted for with more riboflavin in your diet. So I don't think you are an overmethylator per se. I don't think about things in terms of that. Have I read anything about parasite increases throughout the gut due to needing them to break down the meats? And is that a bad thing? Uh, no, I do a lot of GI maps on my clients and we do not see parasites in the gut and we don't need them to break down meat. So not a thing on a carnivore diet. All right, you guys, tons of questions. Um, all right, let's see if we can go to the phone. So I'm gonna scroll through some of the questions on my phone and see if we can answer some of this for you guys. All right, somebody says, do I use activated charcoal for detoxifying? I do not. I think my body, this kind of gets back to the hormesis argument. I think my body can detoxify just fine. I have phase one, phase two enzymatic systems. I don't need activated charcoal. Um, it's only going to bind things that are in my gut. I'm not going to absorb the activated charcoal. It's just going to take out things that are in my gut. So if I'm eating something toxic, I could improve it, but um, I'm not gonna eat those foods that would require that. Um, somebody says, I'm still eating sprouted mac nut butter and sprouted pecan butter is just a little, is sprouted nut butter is a better way to go. Um, a sprouted nut butter is a better way to go, but I still don't think it's awesome. And I think you will feel better when you uh, remove those from your diet. I think nut butters are, um, nuts in general, seeds are some of the worst things for us in terms of digestion. And um, the uh, you can just get plenty of animal fat would be much better suggestion. Kim, I never go to the doc because they try to push vaccines on me every time, even my wife while she was pregnant. Yeah, I mean, I guess that it's a tricky thing there. What percentage of carbs can you eat in your diet before you kick yourself off keto? Um, I don't think about ketogenesis that much, actually. I can usually tell when I'm on a ket in a ketogenic state just because of my um, mental clarity. I think we probably all go in and out of ketosis throughout the day, and that's generally what I aim for. Um, I, I think you probably could eat 5 10% of your diet as carbs, and it depends how many you're burning. And if you have a caloric surplus or a deficit, you could technically eat 100% of your calories as carbs if you have a caloric deficit and still be in ketosis. Is there a way to dump estrogen from the body male just eating mostly meat so little intake now, but there's an accumulation from the past? Hmm. So if, if you have an accumulation of estrogen from the past, that doesn't make sense to me. Your body is always recycling it and there is entire hepatic recycling. Um, if you have a lot of estrogen, um, I wonder how you're um, measuring that, but uh, it shouldn't be accumulated, it's being made because you are passing it out in your stool every day. So if you have lots of estrogen, you are making lots of estrogen and need to figure out where that is coming from. Could too much red meat make my toes turn red? Uh, I don't know, man, I, I doubt it. Uh, my toes are not red. <laughs> put my toes on the uh, live stream here. Somebody said, I mean, I do wonder about fat to protein ratios. When you eat uh, not super high quality meat, wouldn't it be beneficial to eat some fiber to get rid of toxins easier. 
Um, that's a reasonable possibility. I think that if you, the thing you have to realize is that anytime you eat fiber, you're going to not be absorbing some of the nutrients with the meat. So I think that if you're eating less than ideal meat, the fiber could potentially bind some of the toxins that persist in organic pollutants, but I really urge people to vote with their dollars and to figure out how to eat the best quality meat. I think that if you have to use fiber to detoxify your foods, then um, there's kind of a problem there and the priorities are a little out of whack. Um, why does having fat as far as we can uh, lead to over calorie? I'm not sure I understand that. Um, Uh, doo -doo -doo. is iron an inflammatory signaler as root cause protocol suggests please and thank you well um, serum ferritin can rise in inflammation if that's what you're asking about but um, the uh, iron is a necessary mineral in our body so it's not a dangerous thing in general but during inflammation ferritin can rise Someone says they started three milligram boron big muscle pains at the beginning. Any thoughts? Uh, no, that's that's very unusual. I wonder about something in the supplement, perhaps. Um, you shouldn't. Uh, I would make sure it's a good supplement. Um, I don't think you necessarily need boron if you're doing other sources of animal nose to tail, specifically like a bone broth or a bone meal. Been carnivore for a year and a half, still having issues with calves and feet cramping at night. I've tried magnesium, potassium supplement, eating lots of salt, eating no salt. Any suggestions? Um, Austin, what I have found is that magnesium and potassium don't help, um, that it's about salt. And I wonder when you say eating lots, how much you're getting. Um, I feel the best when I'm getting more than 10 grams of sodium chloride per day. And I think I feel even better when I'm getting other minerals too. And I think we have to think about the, the remaining mineral, minerals, magnesium, potassium, um, from food, not from um, supplementation. And then the ones you're uh, not thinking about right now are calcium and boron. And we can get all that from like a bone broth. Um, does anyone else have an inflammatory problem that causes their face and neck to become bright red? Um, that is interesting. That does sound kind of autoimmune. Um, someone says, I've seen my A1C creep up from 5.0 to 5.4 in the last two years eating carnivore is physiological insulin resistance adaptive glucose sparing a bad thing i don't think of this as physiological insulin resistance uh, there are a couple of problems i have with hemoglobin a1c um, if you did a, a cgm uh, brian i would love to see if that would actually reflect a a problem um, yeah um, because i think that a1 the a1c can overestimate fasting glucose in many people on these type of diets. And I don't know whether it's an artifact, whether the red blood cells are living longer. There are many hypotheses, but, and I would wonder about your fat to protein ratio with that creeping A1C. I would suspect that your fasting insulin is still quite low and that there's really no evidence of insulin resistance. It's probably just slightly higher blood sugar because you're eating more protein, but I don't know all of your macros. My question, or in previous email, macadamia nuts bioavailable, how can we measure conversion? of mega crops to grassland for ruminant grazing. Uh, conversion of mega crops to grassland for ruminant grazing. So there's two questions there. Um, macadamia nuts, probably better than other nuts. I'd have to see some actual science regarding the phytic acid and the other anti-nutrients. I just, I'm not convinced that they're ideal. I mean, there are many indigenous cultures that love magongo nuts. If you do okay with macadamia nuts, that's great. I think animal food is still superior. Um, I don't, I think that the bioavailability, I mean, macadamia nuts, um, you'd have to think about how much oxalate is in there and how much phytic acid, that's certainly going to cut down on the bioavailability of macadamia nuts. So I have a story, when I was uh, a runner, I was pretty low in magnesium and I was eating a ton of almonds, which is supposed to be very high in magnesium, but I can't absorb any of it, right? Because of all the phytic acid and oxalates. So um, I'm not convinced that the minerals in macadamia nuts are super bioavailable. Conversion of mega crops to grassland for ruminant grazing, that'd be an amazing step in the right direction. Um, the thing I will say is this. Uh, I, people sometimes ask me, can we feed the world with a carnivore diet? Can we, um, um, can we, can everyone eat grass-fed meat? And I think that's the, that's probably the wrong question to be asking because um, they, they try and um, pull the rug out from under the regenerative agriculture movement saying we can't do this throughout the world. Well, 
I think that the reality is that we can't continue doing uh, monocrop agriculture, that our current system is horrible with regard to animals and with regard to monocrop plants as well. Like what we're doing now with regard to agriculture in general is not sustainable, period. Um, the topsoils have been completely eroded. And the only reason that mesh land in the United States can grow um, uh, plants is because of ammonium nitrate fertilizer and we're putting back fake uh, fertilizer into the land. So when people say that can't, we can't do regenerative agriculture for everyone in the world, I say, we already messed it up. Like there is no, what we're doing now is not sustainable either. So let's do the type of agriculture that was being done before humans were even doing agriculture. And I'm using agriculture in air quotes. When buffalo graze on the land and they move around, they poop, they pee, they impact the land significantly, and then it all regrows. And that's what regenerative agriculture is trying to mimic. And so that's what's so cool for me about what White Oak is doing is that um, they are just trying to make it more wild. They are doing symbiotic organisms uh, co-grazing sheep and ruminants and it works so well as it would have been throughout history. Basically what we're realizing is that we have messed up the ecosystems and we need to recreate the ecosystems as well as we can and regenerative agriculture seeks to recreate ecosystems in the most uh, sustainable way that we can without actually just making everything wild again. So when people say I can't or you can't do regenerative agriculture for everybody on the planet. The other thing I said to them, or well, what I would say in response is, we also can't do non-regenerative agriculture for everyone on the planet because we are destroying the topsoil and that is not sustainable either. All right, a couple more, you guys. I'm gonna wrap this up shortly and move on to some other projects. I hope you all enjoyed this. Check out, if you guys are not subscribed to my newsletter, carnivoremd.com, get on that. The, go, the book, most of you guys bought the book, but if you want to pre-purchase carnivore, the carnivore codebook.com, you can see the title of contents, table of contents, you can order it there. Um, uh, somebody asked, hemochromatosis, is carnivore gonna be a problem with this? I answered that one earlier. No, you can do phlebotomy. Um, so, do, 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 do. Question regarding athletics. Do you think carbon inclusion would improve the ability to perform glycolytic work, especially for long periods like 30 to 60 minutes from Andrew? I, I think it's a very interesting question. I'm not convinced that it does once you're keto adapted, even if you're low level. I think like we talk about, um, we talked about this with Chris Masterjohn. Um, I think that if you are getting enough protein and you're, um, sorry, pause there for a second. If you're getting enough protein and your glycogen stores are full, like we see on the FASTER study, there should not be any decline in glycolytic work without carbs. And there's an improvement in, um, there's an improvement in um, the fat oxidation when you're on a low carb diet. So anyway, hopefully that's helpful. I don't, I'm not convinced that it's an issue, but it's a fascinating question. Um, doo -doo -doo. I am gonna have an audio book for The Carnivore Code. And guess what, you guys? I got a bunch of pressure from my friends. I'm gonna read it. So I'm gonna read the audio book for The Carnivore Code. You're welcome, thank you. It's gonna be a pain in my butt, but um, I will do my best to do that. All right, I'm gonna wrap this up in one sec. Couple more questions. I love doing these guys. It's hard for me to stop. This one's been a solid hour. Um, do, do, do. Somebody says, um, that their deuterium was high after one year on carnivore, five years paleo keto, I would think about your water source. Um, and deuterium is fascinating. I think we have a lot to learn with deuterium right now, you guys, and um, it's very tricky. Um, mine was not as low as I wanted it to be. It was around 140, but I've seen some that are 150, and I would think about your water source. That's probably the biggest source of deuterium is water. I don't think we know everything about deuterium, though, and I don't think we know how important it is um, I think it's something to think about, it's something to learn, but I, there's a lot more to learn there. Um, somebody says, what would the top blood test you recommend? I have my yearly physical in two days. So this is from Baumer Tom. Uh, if you go to my podcast, I did a whole podcast about blood work, and that is what I would recommend, going to that podcast um, and looking at that stuff. I, um, I recommend basically all the inflammatory markers, HSCRP, homocysteine, fibrinogen, um, uh, CBC, CMP, all the thyroid studies, hormones, it's extensive, uh, lipoprotein, lipid panel, I also wanna see GGT, I wanna see serum and urine, heavy metals, uh, 
Um, yeah, all kinds of stuff in there. But if you go to that podcast, in the very beginning of the podcast, I summarize all the blood work that I recommend. So a couple of email questions from Bridget. Um, where would one go to have the testing done for polymorphisms? You talk about like ApoE4 or MTHFR. I would do 23andMe and then use Promethease. What blood work should one add to the regular yearly sampling a GP would request? So I talked about that. Go to the podcast about that. Things that are commonly missed are HSCRP, homocysteine, fasting insulin, GGT, etc. cetera. Uh, it's all in that podcast. Um, all right, you guys, one more question, one or two, and then I'm gonna wrap it up. Somebody said, somebody said, uh, what is the most radical thing you've done? I'll talk about that in a second. Um, somebody says, longbow recurve or compound. I shoot a compound bow right now. Um, somebody says they can't pre-order the book in Canada. I will uh, make it available. It'll be on Amazon next month. Um, somebody says, what plants have you eaten since being carnivore? Be honest. So um, I have had plants three times in the last year and a half plus that I've been on a carnivore diet and every time it's been squash. So I've done three, two to three reintroduction experiments with plants and it's always been squash. That's the only plant I've eaten in the last year and a half. So haven't eaten any leafy greens. I think that those are just not beneficial for humans. Um, and honestly, when I've done the carbohydrate reintroduction experiments, I feel no better. Um, it doesn't really affect me positively. If anything, I think it probably affects me negatively. Um, and I don't really feel like including it. Um, when I do include carbohydrates, I usually go for less fat. Um, somebody says, what are the five plant foods I would eat? So I think that this is an important question, like the least toxic five plant foods. Maybe things like olives, avocado, maybe squash. Um, maybe occasional fruit. I'm not a huge fan. I think excess, fructo excess fructose messes with their biochemistry. Yeah, I can't even get to five, you guys. Uh, maybe avocado. I said that one already. Um, somebody says, any tips to boost testosterone when eating carnivores? So if somebody has low testosterone and it, it showed up on carnivore, I would wonder about protein and fat ratios, adequate uh, calories, uh, sleep, thyroid, and many other things there. So I'd have to see more of the labs and want to see FSH and LH. So um, I'd also want to make sure you're getting enough boron um, on a carnivore diet. So that was, that was where I would start. Um, do, 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 Paul, can there be an issue with glucocorticoids opposing T3 hormone production? Um, let's see here. Where did it go? Paul, stop answering questions. Hello. <laughs> boron source is uh, bone broth if you're using a uh, acidic bone uh, broth. I want to come to Sydney and shoot arrows with you, man. Yeah, of course. Um, doo -doo -doo. Olives do have oxalates. It's low-ish, but again, somebody asked me which five plants. I was trying to think of the least toxic ones. Um, what are my thoughts on carnivore for barbell training? I was keto for years. I <clears throat> love how I feel on carnivore outside the gym, uh, given the vertical diet, to try to see if it's a good fit. Um, so if you, I think that if you're getting enough protein, enough calories, and you fully keto adapt, you should be fine on a carnivore diet outside of the gym too. That would be my suspicion. I haven't noticed any problems for me. Somebody says, my wife is breastfeeding. <clears throat> how does carnivore stack up to keep milk production as long as she has a caloric surplus? I think it'll be just fine. All right. Um, oh, uh, glucocorticoids opposing T3 hormones production, Kyle Mamonis suggesting something along this line. Except that if you look at the research, glucocorticoids are not increased on a ketogenic diet uh, long term. I talked about this on the podcast with Chris Masterjohn. So uh, many of the studies that acolytes of Ray Pete, this is Danny Roddy, Kyle, um, Chris Masterjohn as well, point to with regard to higher levels of glucocorticoids, specifically cortisol are short-term studies, and once someone is keto-adapted, the research seems to show that these hormones go back to normal. So um, yeah, I get this all the time uh, from the repeat folks, and it drives me a little crazy, but anyway. <coughs> um, uh, I heard you about your experience with veganism, tooth decay. I was five years vegan, had similar experience. What do you think causes this? Uh, lack of fat-soluble minerals and tons of fructose and sugar on the teeth. I think that... Um, you can tell when you eat a carnivore diet that your gums get better. So I had gum recession, which stopped and reversed when I went carnivore. I have other friends who have had the same thing. I think that one of the greatest uh, benefits of a carnivore diet is the improvement in um, 
uh, overall oral health. All right, one more question, then I'm out, you guys. Thank you so much. Check out the book. If you haven't pre-ordered it, please pre-order the book. Uh, I appreciate you all. Um, all right. Somebody says, do, do, do. good source of calcium for babies allergic to milk and eggs. How about uh, acidic bone broth? Um, a bone broth would be a good thing, or a bone meal from a uh, low heavy metal cow. Somebody says, acidic broth source, sorry, would that be from animal or from the cooking down process example, adding ACV? Yes, that's exactly what I'm talking about, Chris. Just that when you make the bone broth, you want the broth to be acidic, uh, not that it's going to be acidic in humans. So you want the bone broth to be acidic. Um, uh, when you make it, it will pull the, um, the minerals out of the bones more. Um, somebody says gluconeogenesis on carnivore. Yep, probably happening. Probably not a bad deal. Salt. Take uh, torsamid high water pill three uh, a day in potassium 20 milliequivalents. Oh, well, that's more complicated. So if you're if you have high blood pressure and you're taking torsamide and potassium, uh, you're gonna have to see your doctor about that. I would suggest. I would think that um, you have some degree of insulin resistance causing that hypertension. Uh, salt is definitely uh, Redmond sea salt. All right. All right, you guys, I'm going to jump. I appreciate you all. Uh, we'll do it again soon.